sake of not going into a cold metabolic torpor, I'm going to move around a bit. But uh, today I'm going to be talking about metabolic profiling of lung cancer and it's a feasible approach. Basically, lung cancer is just an awful disease. The uh, survival rate for five years is about 12 percent, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that lung tumors are just hard to get to. They can't be resected. Seventy percent of them are stuck in the lungs and can't be accessed by surgery. And so, basically, all they look, all those patients rely on are chemotherapy as an approach and also radiological. And right now, those approaches are just awful. 40 years of research in lung cancer, and we've extended the survival about an average of two weeks. It's just awful. So we are looking at new therapies. Lots of scientists are looking at uh, molecular diagnostics, molecular therapies. But in order to explore those molecular therapies, you need to understand the biochemistry of those lung tumors, especially the subtypes. A particular review of interest by uh, Matthew van der Heiden looked at the cancer's metabolism in general, and he indicated through these uh, targets that these are future targets of interest for uh, cancer therapies uh, specifically, and also for lung cancer. And so as you can see, this is your traditional um, glycolysis pathway, TCA cycle. There's a lot of different energy metabolism enzymes that uh, could be potential targets for lung therapy. But how those relate to the biochemistry and the metabolomes, I think, could explain the efficacy of the drugs that you target here. And so Dr. Boyson, uh, my PI, asked this question. Can tumor subtypes be distinguished based on their met uh, metabolomic profiles? And it's an important question because we looked at genomics, we've looked at proteomics, transcri uh, transcriptomics. But metabolomics alone, can you distinguish uh, different tumor types using their metabolomes? we have a couple different approaches. We have a global metabolomic approach, and also we have a target approach. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with metabolomics, basically we're looking at small molecules. Molecules that range from masses of about 50 all the way up to maybe 1,600 mass. And so we look at those small molecules uh, with a couple different uh, approaches. LCMS, GCMS for the smaller molecules. Our lab uses LCMS. And so the difference between global and, uh, and targeted is basically global, you just send your sample through the LCMS and you just look for uh, unspecific mass to charge ratios and retention times. You have no idea what that molecule is, but it'll give you uh, a, a baseline for separating uh, using panels. Target metabolomics, on the other hand, you know what molecule is that you're looking for and you can distinguish uh, the retention times and the mass to charge ratios with those. Um, we use a cell culture model approach to basically establish metabolomics. Because right now, metabolomics um, gets a lot of flack, I guess. Uh, and so using the cell culture approach first, we just kind of prove our model and then we'll apply that to clinical specimen. So first I want to talk about the global metabolomic approach. The cell culture model, we use ATCC, typical cell lines. We have the malignant cell lines, uh, adenocarcinoma. We use three separate cell lines from ATCC. Squamous cell carcinoma. And these two cell lines here, they comprise the majority of lung cancer, especially non-small cell lung cancer. And then also we used a fibroblast from the lungs for our control. And so we have three cell lines here for deno, three for squamous cell, and then also three, or two from squamous cell and also three from the fibroblast. We just culture them according to traditional protocol, RPMI, complete medium. Um, we accrued them out all in five flats of replicates to get the power that we needed for our um, extraction and identification. Uh, we extract the metabolites using a traditional method uh, with a little slight alteration. If you ever ever grown uh, flasks of cells out, you trypsinize, and you have this 15 minute of the wash period, you lose a lot of just the stability in those metabolites. And so what we do, remove the media and then flash freeze them with liquid nitrogen. And so you get that immediate um, a quenching of the, of the enzymes so you can catch those metabolites in their hopefully native form. Um, and then finally, we uh, ran those um, uh, samples through LCMS and looked for their uh, mass charge ratios and of course the retention times and the area and responses. So here's a, just a, an example, representative chromatogram, squamous cell carcinoma, 
on the top, adenocarcinoma in the middle, and then the non-malignant fibroblasts. You can see the relative abundance, um, and then also acquisition over 20 minutes. And right now it looks very, very similar, but you can notice slight differences in the peaks. But slight differences in, in chromatograms make a huge impact on the spectra. And as you can see here in that squamous cell carcinoma, we have multiple different ions that are coming out that are different from fibroblast. And this is just a representation of the numerous ions that are different between the different uh, cell culture groups. So once we have uh, identified um, the mass charge ratios and we call them features, we don't call them metabolites, just features, we basically run multivariate analysis, narrow it down to uh, using like technical replication, make sure that these features are actually present, and then we reduce our, uh, our samples, or our features down to about uh, 200 significant features between the groups. And once we've run a multivariate analysis, here's some of the results. You have partial least squares discriminant analysis here, and then principal component analysis, the unsupervised. Uh, black is adenocarcinoma, red is squamous cell carcinoma, and the green is fibroblast. And as you can see, you get this beautiful separation between adenocarcinoma and squamous, but also between adenocarcinoma and the uh, non-malignant fibroblasts. Same thing with the unsupervised analysis. Not quite as clean, but that's why it's unsupervised. But we established this method. Cell culture is great, but how does this apply to uh, human samples? So we're lucky enough at UAMS to have access to a, a bronchoscopy suite where we'll go and we'll get samples from lymph node biopsies, so the fine needle aspirates that uh, the pulmonologist will go in and take fluid out of the lymph node and basically stage it for lung cancer. If it's infiltrated, it's known as positive. If it's non-infiltrated, it's negative. And so we have positively identified adenocarcinoma, 10 patients, positively identified squamous cell carcinoma, 10 patients, and also the non-malignant, 10 patients. So this is a pilot study. We're just trying to establish that metabolomics can be used. And so basically the same method of extracting metabolites from the cell line and also running them on LCMS doing the global uh, metabolomics. And in here you can see, not quite as clean as the cell culture, but we're talking about lymph node fluids. So we were really excited that with lymph node fluids, we could separate the squamous cell from these other two groups. And so the features that are in this, uh, that help distinguish this group could be used as a biomarker panel. The same thing with adenocarcinoma from the non-malignant um, group as well. Basically, uh, we had two samples, as you can see here and here, that don't quite fit our model, but uh, when we started thinking about it, uh, histopathologists have an error rate of about 30%, and then also we have uh, adenocarcinoma subtypes, ALK positive, ALK negative, so there's different subtypes to, uh, to consider. And so we were extremely excited about the separation that we had with uh, two different independent analyses here. So I want to basically, uh, I hope that I've convinced you with this first approach that global metabolomics is a feasible tool to use for diagnostics um, with the lymph node fluids and also that we established it with our cell lines. So metabolomics uh, in complement with histopathology could actually improve the diagnosis of specific cancers and even subtypes. But that was just one approach that we used. We also did a targeted metabolic approach. And so I'm going to show you a whole array of metabolites. Don't worry about the huge list, but basically these endogenous metabolites that we were uh, curious about. And it relates back to that review of the energy molecules that are in, uh, that, are, that might be changed with uh, cancer, uh, cancer pathways. And so with this uh, panel, we ran a targeted met uh, metabolic approach. And I want to show you a few uh, representative metabolites. Here you can see Sam saw. You have the ratio surrounding a particular methyl transferase enzyme. There's many, many different methyl transferases that, that work on this, but this ratio can be indicative of maybe the, a drug's efficacy for, uh, for the uh, uh, reducing of cancer proliferation. And so basically, you, see you have fibroblast cells that have an elevated level of SAM. And then you have the adenocarcinoma with a lower level of SAM or an elevated level of SA. So what does that tell us? Well, it's probably some methylation pools happening. We've had a couple methylation talks already from UAMS. 
And basically, the same cell ratio is indicative of adenocarcinoma. Not so much squamous cell carcinoma, extremely variable disease. Here's another important pathway that we looked at. Glutathione and glutamate, extremely important cancer, we all know that. But this pathway, looking at glutamate, glutathione, and a ratio, you can see that glutathione is indicative of adenocarcinoma and also squamous cell carcinoma. And in particular, this rapidly growing squamous cell carcinoma that has a doubling time of like 12 hours, extremely aggressive. And so glutathione in relation to glutamate seems to be indicative of squamous cell carcinoma and a little bit less or so for adenocarcinoma. So hopefully I've shown you that global metabolomics is an appropriate appro approach for identifying different cancer types, not only in cell culture, but also in lymph node biopsies. And additionally, target metabolomics is suitable for identifying alterations in specific enzymes that are up or down regulated, and also pathways that are, uh, that are uh, reg up regulated or down regulated. But uh, that was really exciting. We presented some of this information at the AACR meeting well, last April, and we were approached by uh, a certain industry and they were extremely curious about these lymph node uh, infiltrated samples that we have because it's a, it's a unique volume, it's a very small volume, and they're infiltrated with so many cancer cells that you can really detect those biomarkers. And so this company said, well, let's work together and uh, what, what, are, uh, what are some of the uh, metabolites that uh, they were interested in? And they have particular metabolites, uh, A and B, proprietary reasons, I can't really get into it, but these metabolites are indicative of adenocarcinoma in those patients versus the non-malignant. Again, squamous is extremely variable in its disease state. And so this particular ratio was indicative of adenocarcinoma patients. It's extremely exciting. Again, small, very, very small pilot study. But metabolomics can be an applicable tool for diagnostics, maybe prognostics as well. So we're hoping to continue to identify some of these samples in the global um, global approach that we use, go identify those features, figure out what pathways they're involved with, and then maybe relate that to a specific enzyme target in the energy pathways. And of course, we want to validate some of those metabolite panels. We could potentially use them as diagnostic tools. And then also, um, targeting metabolites of interest, maybe doing some modeling studies and uh, looking at uh, blocking out certain enzymes and see how those metabolite pools change. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, team, Dr. Gunnar Boyson, and the uh, advice he's given me and the expert leadership he's given me, and also Julie Evans, Scott Helms, for their invaluable advice. Our clinical team, the Barters, and also a statistical team that helped immensely with the multivariate analysis. Any questions? That is a great question. So he asked if someone's on a high protein diet with the small sample size that we have at this point, how are we gonna adjust for that? And uh, at this point, we don't have a large enough sample to adjust for that. Uh, but there's enough metabolites that are not amino acid specific that we are getting uh, separation. There's a lot of lipids that are separating these groups. It's a lot of lymph node environment, a lot of fatty, uh, fatty acids and lipids that separate. And so, that's a good point. We haven't really gone into controlling for that until we get enough patients. You showed the GSH to the ratios. Did you look at the GSH to the GSSG ratios? Yes, yes, we did as, as well. Um, and so, GSH is a total GSH. Uh -huh. um, and so, oxidation versus reduced, it's right. a huge problem with the thion, but that's a total. And so, uh, yeah, we did look at that. What'd you see? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, so, there was a total of, of the two together glutathione, oxidized, reduced, oh, and the ratio. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't make myself clear. Since we have another issue, another agenda for doing the lunch break, we have to meet the students. So uh, we encourage you guys to talk 